today we are moving into the next segment of our chemistry unit. So the first part of this unit had to do with like how do we understand atoms. We good? So the first part of this unit had to do with things like how do we understand atoms? How do I read the periodic table and use that to figure out things like how many protons, neutrons, electrons, valence electrons, electron shells, what's the atomic mass, what's the mass of one atom, what's the mass of a mole of atoms? That was, how do I draw a planetary model? That was like the first unit, okay? The second portion of this was learning about bonds. So we learned about ionic bonds and how atoms could lose or gain electrons in order to fulfill the octet rule and become stable. And that if you had a positively charged cation and a negatively charged anion, they could draw together like tiny magnets uh, in order to create new chemical compounds. And we learned about covalent bonds, which is where the atoms share those valence electrons in order to obtain the same goal, to follow that octet rule, to have eight or zero, to have eight valence electrons uh, and be stable. Today, we are sort of transitioning into the next se section of our chemistry. So in this unit, what we're going to be doing is you're finally going to begin coloring in your periodic tables. So your periodic table already has some features on it, but starting tomorrow we're going to begin going through the table group by group, and you're going to be coloring in each group as we go. And as we go, you're going to be learning about the properties that each group has. So at the end, it's going to look more or less like this. Um, there are going to be six different groups of metals that we'll, we'll cover, so you're going to need to save a section at the bottom where you'll create a key for each of the metals. There will be three groups of non-metals that we're going to cover, so you'll need to save a section at the bottom to have a little key showing, showing what colors represent those three groups of non-metals. And we'll have one group that is neither metals nor non-metals, but sort of in between. Now, the whole point of this is that while it would be incredibly unreasonable to expect anyone to like memorize the periodic table in any sort of useful way or know everything about every element. If we can divide the elements up into specific categories and then learn the properties of those categories, then you can end up with knowledge of the whole periodic table without having to study 118 different elements. So today we're going to we're going to talk about the biggest group that we could talk about which is to just say most elements are metals. And if we talk about the properties of metals, then we are talking about the properties of basically, like almost all the elements, right? The vast majority of them are metals. All right, so our goals for today, we're gonna talk about metals. Metals are important because it's most of the elements. So I'm gonna cover first off what all counts as a metal and how to tell if something is a metal. Then we're gonna go over the basic properties that all metals share. Um, and then we're going to talk about one final kind of bond, which is metallic bonding. Tomorrow we're going to start going into more specific groups. So right now, uh, you can basically think there's sort of two overarching categories that elements can fall under, metals or non-metals. And there's a, a couple elements that sort of are the borderline between those two, where they're kind of in between. We call those metalloids. So, most of the elements on the periodic table are metals. And this is an important thing to note. So basically everything on the left hand side, except for hydrogen, hydrogen happens to be a non-metal, but all of the other alkaline metals, all of the other alkaline earth metals, this entire middle section, all metals, there's some elements here that aren't colored in, but those are probably metals as well. It's just that these are synthetic elements that were made in a, a lab and we didn't ever gather enough of them together to really say much specifically about their properties, which is why they're not colored in here. But these ones probably also metals. Uh, these two bottom rows down here, the lanthanides and the actinides, also metals. And the metals kind of creep out over here a little bit as well. Uh, so broadly speaking, this is a huge category. So if you know the properties about metals, you're going to be able to use that over and over again every time we talk about any of these groups. So you want to have a page in your notes called Properties of Metals that we're going to have this information on 
so that you know tomorrow when we cover the alkali metals, you don't have to specifically write down every property that they have that they have just because they're a metal. You'll be able to say, hey, they have all the metal properties, and you can put this. Much. And same deal, you know, when we cover the alkaline earth metals, you'll be able to go, oh, they've got all the metal properties too, and just flip back to the same page and not have to write the same things over and over and over again. So if you write this down now, it'll save you a bunch of time in the future. So, don't worry if you don't get all this down immediately. I'm gonna pause on each and every one of these points so you'll have time to go over them. But these are, broadly speaking, the properties that all metals share. All metals are conductive to both heat and electricity. They are malleable, they are ductile, so malleable means they flatten rather than shattering. Ductile means we can make wires out of them. They tend to have high melting points, which means they tend to be solids at room temperatures. Again, there's always exceptions, but broadly speaking. And these things tend to form, oh, say it with me, positive cations. So those are the broad category, the broad things that we can say about just about all metals, which is a huge number of elements. Yes. Uh, I am gonna go to each of these. I'm gonna spend time on each of these slides. So we'll get more detail about each of these. So if you don't get it done now, that's okay. So let's start with the idea that metals are malleable. Uh, I want each of you to take a moment, close your eyes, and imagine in front of you there is a beautiful glass Coca-Cola bottle. Think like the classic Coca-Cola shape glass bottle empty right in front of you. And also in front of you there is an empty aluminum Coca-Cola can. You can picture these two objects. Yes, Maya? It, it says, so when you like stomp on a can, I'm talking about Yes. <laughs> yes. So imagine these two things, the glass Coca-Cola bottle, the metal Coca-Cola can. Imagine in your hands you have two hammers. And you take these hammers and you smash both objects in one strong blow. Right? The glass bottle, what does it do? Shatters. Shatters. Right? The can, what does the can do? Smushes. It just squishes down. Because the can is made of metal and metal is malleable. So metals, when you hit them with a hammer, they tend to flatten or squish rather than shatter. Think about like the classic image of like the blacksmith with the sword or the horseshoes, and they're hitting it with a hammer to change the shape of the metal, right? That is a thing we can do with metals, but not with non-metals. Nobody, you know, you don't ever imagine like somebody hitting a piece of wood with a hammer in order to make a chair. Right? That's not what we do, but we do hit things with hammers if we're trying to engage in metal working. Because metals are malleable, while non-metals tend to be brittle, which means they will shatter like that glass bottle. All right, so the next property of metals is that metals are ductile. So to be ductile is a very simple term. All it means is you can draw them out into a wire. That's all it means to be ductile. All right, next property of metals. Metals tend to have really high melting points. Now I want to take a moment and explain something about melting points. You are probably used to thinking of certain substances as having their, a particular phase that they're in. You're like, you know, nitrogen gas, that's a gas, right? Water is a liquid. Uh, a hunk of iron is a solid. That's not fundamentally true. Instead, every single pure substance has a temperature at which it is a liquid, and a temperature at which it's a gas, and a temperature at which it is a solid. This is true for any pure substance. Mixtures, not so much. But for any pure substance, there is a specific temperature where these phase changes happen. For example, water below zero degrees Celsius is going to be a solid, it'll be ice. Between zero and 100 degrees Celsius, it will be a liquid. And above 100 degrees Celsius, it'll be a gas. You might be used to nitrogen gas in our atmosphere being a gas, but if we get it cold enough, it can become liquid nitrogen. Uh, you might be used to iron being a solid, 
But if we increase its temperature a little bit, we could melt it. So the thing I mean when I say, hey, metals have a high melting point, means that metals in general are more likely, not guaranteed, there's always going to be exceptions, but they're more likely to be a solid at room temperature. Usually you have to get them pretty hot for them to melt. Talia. Can metals turn into gas? Yes. If you get them hot enough, you could have gaseous iron. It would be really, really freaking hot though, right? So metals are mostly going to exist as solids, or maybe if we, if we work really hard as liquids in your lifetime of experience, like maybe someday you'll visit a forge and you'll see liquid metal. You actually have all seen liquid metal because you, you melted solder, right? You, you did a phase change there where you turned a solid into a liquid. Um, but broadly speaking, it's going to be pretty rare for any of you. I, I doubt that any of you will ever see a gaseous metal in your lifetime. With that said, there are always, always, always going to be exceptions. So here's some of the interesting fun fact exceptions. Uh, mercury is a liquid at room temperature. It's just a bit weird in that way. Uh, gallium is a metal that actually melts right around human body temperature. Um, so that's one that you can like very easily see the shift between a solid and a liquid like in your hands. Yeah. So whenever you see like a spoon go into water and melt, is that one of these? Oh uh, yeah, you could probably that would probably be like you could do that with a gallium spoon. But it would have to be hot water. Yeah, a gallium spoon in hot water would absolutely melt. Uh, like, you, uh, these you don't have to. This is just to. My main goal here is to make it clear. As with everything I tell you in this chemistry class, don't take them as like the absolute uttermost like no exceptions things. Everything I tell you, there's a million exceptions to. We're covering the groundwork, the basic levels, the introductory stuff, not every single edge case. Uh, and then another example of sort of lower, but still more reasonable melting points are things like uh, tin and lead, which are used to make solder. And solder will melt at a couple hundred degrees Celsius, you know, a temperature that you can reach with a soldering iron, but they're not gonna be melting at uh, temperatures that are easy to create without tools. All right, next idea with metals, next property, is these things tend to have smaller numbers of valence electrons, which means, broadly speaking, they're going to want to give away electrons. Metals are very much not attached to their electrons. They tend to either give them away or be willing to do a very particular special kind of sharing electrons. They can't do covalent bonds, because in order to do a covalent bond, you need to be able to, through sharing, get to that full outermost electron shell. And these things don't have enough electrons to do that. But they will very happily give away their electrons. So metals can serve as the positive cation in an ionic compound. Typically, the negative ions are anions almost always are made from non-metals. So if you combine a metal with a non-metal, that usually gets you an ionic compound. Covalent compounds, those ones that we talked about last week where we're sharing the valence electrons, that is pretty much only done between two non-metals. So two non-metals can form a covalent bond. A metal and a non-metal can form an ionic bond, and if you only have metals, there is a special kind of bond that they can do, which we'll talk about in a little bit. What's it called? So the next property of metals is that these things are conductive. They conduct heat, and they conduct electricity. And you're probably pretty intuitively familiar with both of these concepts. If you've got a vat of boiling soup, and you have a wooden spoon in there and you've got a metal spoon in there, the metal spoon is gonna get really hot and you'll burn your hand if you reach out and grab it. But the wooden spoon you can safely grab and you know, stir your cauldron. We know that metals are conductive, that's why we use things like copper tape and solder when we were doing our paper circuits. Right? So we know that all metals are actually conductive. You could build a paper circuit with any kind of metal if you had the stuff. Uh, a lot of your buttons were made using aluminum tape rather than copper tape. 
All right, so we know metals are conductive. Let's talk about why they're conductive. I said just a moment ago that metals are willing to give away their electrons. They're actually able to give away their electrons in a way that's so intense that if the only thing you have to deal with are metals, they basically will all share all of their valence electrons to such an extent that you can't even say like, oh, this electron belongs to this atom. So with ionic bonds, it's like, oh, that one lost its electron, doesn't have it, and this, oh, this atom stole its electron, this, this atom you know, owns this electron now. And with covalent bonds, it was like, oh, you know, the electrons are orbiting between two atoms. Both of these atoms own this electron. With metals and this special secret third kind of bonding called metallic bonding, with metals, nobody owns the electrons. They're effectively collectively owned, right? It's full-on electron communism with the valence electrons when we talk about uh, metals and the special third kind of bond called metallic bonding. So when there is metallic bonding, all of the valence electrons belong to everyone, and the valence electrons go wherever they need to go. That's why metals conduct electricity so well, because if one atom gets an extra electron, it's just gonna pass that electron on to somebody else, because it's like everyone owns all the electrons. So that makes it really easy to set up a flow of electrons through a circuit. But none of the atoms actually own the electrons. And this results in something very special, which is that metals actually don't have to form a chemical compound. They don't have to be a part of a molecule to be stable. Something like oxygen, you'll never find just a single oxygen atom floating around in nature. It doesn't exist because it's not stable on its own. In nature, you can find oxygen gas, which is two oxygens bonded to each other, but you will never find just a single oxygen hanging out on its own. Metals, you can have just like a, an ingot of gold or a chunk of iron, right? You could have a bowl of gallium or a bowl of mercury, and it's fine, it's not unstable, it can just exist without having to be in a chemical reaction with something else. Because this electron C, which is the you know, communally owned set of electrons, where the electrons don't belong to any particular atom, but instead belong to everyone, allows the individual metal atoms to stay stable, even without forming a proper like chemical compound. All right, so we've talked about the properties of metals. We've talked about how almost all the things on the periodic table are metals. And we talked about metallic bonds and the electron C. I think we have just enough time that y'all should all be able to finish today's assignment, which is the Chem 09 Classic. <laughs>